Thank you for joining our Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer webinar series. Today's webinar on genomics and molecular testing is the first in a series of 12 monthly webinars. I am Mary Margaret Kilmeyer, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I am the Programs Director for Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and recently completed my doctorate. My clinical and research background is focused on working collaboratively with patients, doctors, patients' families and caregivers, and members of the healthcare team. We would like to thank our title sponsor, Boston Biomedical, and our platinum sponsor, Lilly Oncology, for providing funding to make this webinar possible. We would also like to thank our promotional partners, the American Association for Cancer Research, the Anti-Cancer Club, Canadian Cancer Survivors Network, Cure Magazine, the Esophageal Cancer Action Network, Patient Resource, and Saver Health. You will be able to ask questions during this presentation. You can type your questions into the white text box that appears on your screen. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will address questions as time allows. In addition, the recording of this webinar will be accessible on our website in approximately one week. First, I will share information with you about Debbie Stream Foundation, and then we will hear a presentation by Dr. Adam Bass of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and then we will conclude with a question and answer session. Pictured here is the president and founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer, Debbie Zellman. Debbie was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer in April of 2008. A practicing attorney and mother of three, she had no risk factors for stomach cancer and her symptoms were very vague. At the time, she was told her chances of being alive in five years was only 4%. She's endured harsh chemo regimens and targeted treatments, experienced eight recurrences in over eight years, and is still a patient to this day. Debbie founded DDF in April of 2009, just one year after her diagnosis. As an organization, we are a member of several advocacy coalitions, including the Deadliest Cancers Coalition, the Patient Equal Access Coalition, the State Patient Equal Access Coalition, and One Voice Against Cancer. In addition, Debbie serves as a patient advocate on numerous committees and task forces. Some of you may be familiar with the facts and statistics about stomach cancer, and they are continually being updated. In 2017, it is estimated that more than 28,000 Americans will be diagnosed with stomach cancer, and more than 11,000 will die. 80% of all patients are diagnosed at stage four, when the five-year survival rate is only 5%, and incidence rates in younger populations has increased, while the expected frequency has been on the decline, and many know very little about this deadly disease. Debbie's Dream Foundation is dedicated to raising awareness about stomach cancer, advancing funding for research, and providing education and support internationally to patients, families, and caregivers. Our ultimate goal is to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. You can learn more by visiting our website at www.debbiesdream.org. In the few short years that DDF has been a foundation, we have achieved many great milestones. We have 25 chapters across the United States, Canada, and Germany, and events are ongoing around the country year-round. Our patient resource education program helps patients and their families around the world by matching them with survivors and caregivers using disease-specific criteria. We host educational webinars, such as the one you're listening to today, and live symposia year-round that are also webcast across the globe. Our website includes in-depth information about stomach cancer that can be translated into more than 60 languages. And we have also provided $650,000 in research grants and advocated for research funding at a national level during our Stomach Cancer Capitol Hill Advocacy Day and have had stomach cancer added to the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program. We're thrilled to share with you that for fiscal year 2015, stomach cancer was awarded $5.8 million in research grants. And here you can take a look at our website's homepage with links to many of the numerous resources and information I just listed, including our online stomach cancer support community. There are many great events that are coming up uh, that you can become involved in, including our fifth annual Advocacy Day in Washington next week. The Los Angeles Stomach Cancer Education Symposium will take place on March 18th and our seventh annual Stomach Cancer Education Symposium in Hollywood, Florida will be held on April 29th. 
Both of these events will be live webcast around the world and translated into other languages. So if you cannot join us in person, please check our website for more information and register for the online webcast. On the evening of April 29th, we'll also be hosting the 8th Annual Dream Makers Gala, a night dedicated to celebrating the year and the accomplishments of the organization. For more information about these and other events, please go to our website. DDF is headquartered in Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Also on this slide are important phone numbers and email addresses that you can use to contact our office. We will now start the presentation on genomics and molecular testing. Our presenter is Dr. Adam Bass from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Bass is an assistant professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School and an associate member of the Broad Institute. His interests led him to researching genomic alterations in GI cancers. Dr. Bass is the co-chair of the Cancer Genome Atlas Studies in Gastric and Esophageal Cancer, and we are very proud to have Dr. Bass as a member of our medical advisory board. At this time, I will turn the webinar over to Dr. Bass. Uh, <clears throat> great. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Mary. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, just let me know if you have any uh, problems hearing. Um, and Mary, would you prefer that we uh, wait to do questions till the end, or should, or should we um, do some kind of as things go in the middle? Um, People will be typing their questions in throughout the presentation, so we'll go ahead and do that at a segment at the end. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so thanks everyone for um, for tuning in. So just uh, go through. So first slide is just the disclosures involving some research funding that we get. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit about today, and um, um, and you know these slides are very similar to uh, ones that I showed um, at the um, uh, symposium last year, but I have a few changes, but then can talk about even more uh, newer things uh, in the question and answer. What I'm going to be talking about is really how we're thinking about uh, changing uh, cancer medicine now in the um, in the current era and in terms of um, moving forward in the future and as a little bit of uh, background I'm by training a medical oncologist um, uh, but I spend most of my time these days uh, running a research laboratory working on the genomics uh, biology and targeted therapy of these cancers and so even although I have uh, clinical background. I'm not uh, in the clinic day to day right now, um, working on patients, but more working on uh, therapy in the lab. And part of what brought me here was um, in my training, I saw the more conventional way for dealing with uh, cancer, especially more advanced cancer that can't be cured surgically. Um, and that more traditional way was by using different chemotherapy drugs, which are you know, more sort of poisonous uh, compounds that have some more effect in cancer cells than normal cells, uh, but have obvious limitations, as everyone knows. And increasingly, how we're moving to is trying to think about a more biologically driven therapy, where we try to understand what makes each cancer tick, and sometimes we call those particular alt, um, features of the cancer, what's driving the cancer, and then try to attack those driving features of the tumor. And as well, there's a lot of new enthusiasm, as I'm sure many of you know, about using new immune therapies. So next slide, please. <clears throat> and um, as Mary mentioned earlier, uh, some of the work that we do um, has involved looking at the genome. And what the genome refers to is basically the DNA. So every you know, cell in our body has, um, in theory, the same DNA, the, the different chromosomes that we inherited either from our uh, mother or our father. 
um, and um, and basically this these uh, DNA into these different chromosomes is a very uh, complex uh, instruction manual for all the cells in our body telling the um, uh, basically the, uh, the cookbook for the cells to make all kinds of different proteins that do the work uh, in the cell and uh, there's basically three billion letters in this book that's the human genome in this sort of manual for how our cells should make proteins and decide what to do and so forth. Um, next slide. And one analogy that we use to think about cancer is that um, cancer is a disease that's caused in part by uh, mutations or changes in the genes in our chromosome that then change the function of uh, some of the different proteins in our body and, or, or proteins in individual cells, I would say. And each cell in our body um, has a mix of different proteins with different functions. And one analogy people make to cancer is that uh, um, the cell can be sort of like a, a car and a car has um, pieces in it that make it go. You have your gas pedal and your engine and you also have pieces of your car, uh, parts of your car that's responsible for slowing the car, such as the car's brakes. And a similar analogy can be made to each of the cells of our body. There are certain processes in our body that promote cells to grow and to proliferate and to divide. And there are also uh, processes in each of the cells of our body which are responsible for slowing growth. And as a cell gets mutations in its genome, as the DNA changes, what you could imagine uh, happening is that you're altering some of those very mechanisms that controls growth. And so just like if you had a car um, where your um, you know, gas pedal was stuck to the floor, you imagine that car would be going faster. And if you had a car where uh, somehow the brake line was cut, the car would have trouble slowing down. In a way, uh, cancer does that, is that you pretty much turn on the, the mechanisms promoting growth by altering the genes for those different um, um, mechanisms uh, by activating them, and then you turn off the mechanisms that are responsible for slowing the car or slowing the cell down by basically you know cutting the, the brakes of the cell. Um, and so, from studying the cancer genome, we could learn the ways that different cancers are able to uh, activate their growth and repress the mechanisms that would be slowing them down. So, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Actually, uh, can you hit uh, advance again and. One more time, perfect. Um, so now I, I, I like to put this slide in when I talk to, 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 to patients because um, sometimes talking about the genome can be a little bit confusing because there's different ways that people look at DNA or DNA in the, um, um, the there are d d DNA changes that can relate to diseases. Um, and when we talk about the genome, it's good to put, especially for cancer, to put this into two big categories, what we call somatic and what we call germline. Um, what somatic means is somatic means the changes in your DNA or changes in the genome that were not what you inherited from your parents. These are the, the changes that you acquired in individual cells during your life, and these are called mutations or a, a, a mutant is something that has changed. And in the context of cancer, what this is important is because we're looking at ways that the cancer cell, the DNA in the cancer cell is different from the normal cells of the body. And overwhelmingly when people talk about uh, uh, genes in cancer, especially genes that are therapeutic targets, they're really uh, overwhelmingly talking about these somatic alterations, the ways that the cancer cell is different from the, um, the, uh, the normal cells of the body. And, um, 
And what's important for that is that because uh, these alterations, such as an ERB2 um, um, activation in the gastric cancer, they're in the, the, the cancer cells, not the normal cells. These aren't the kind of um, uh, alterations that they get passed down to, to people's children or get inherited from someone's parents. By contrast, there are uh, people in, in cancer and other diseases looking at DNA, but looking for what we call the germline alterations, or basically the kind of features of the DNA that you inherit from your parents. And so because they, you um, inherit these genes, it means that all of the cells of your body have these gene alterations. And um, there are situations where there are genes you can inherit that are uh, very pertinent to cancer, such as the um, inherited um, risk variants. You know, you know the, probably the most famous is the BRCA1 genes that people inherit that put them, or those, those variants, not the genes, but variants in those genes make them at higher risk for uh, breast and ovarian cancer. And there are some uh, uh, variants not in, oh, well, but there are some variants that, that are associated with GI cancer, including gastric and esophageal cancer. Uh, but, but most, you know, most patients, to our knowledge, with esophageal and gastric or colon or pancreatic cancer um, don't have cancer for those reasons. And so pretty much what I'm going to be talking about here are really these somatic alterations, the way that the, uh, the cancer cell is different than the cells of the rest of the body. Next slide, please. Uh, and please go through one more, one more, thanks. And um, now there's different ways that the DNA in a cancer cell can be altered uh, to promote um, uh, cancer and in ways that actually can be relevant to thinking about uh, cancer therapy. So one first way is that the cancer genes can get what's called a, a mutable or what we call a mutation. And that's really where you just have the letters of the genome and one letter gets switched for um, a, another letter. So it's really just a typographical error. In a place you should have an A, there's a T, or instead of an A, there's a G. And um, for certain cancer genes, such as the ones I list here, KRAS or BRAF, just changing one single letter in the gene can have a drastic effect and activate those genes. And there are some examples very commonly, such as there's a, a letters that get changed in the e EGFR gene in non-small cell lung cancer that lead to tumors that are highly sensitive to uh, EGFR inhibitors like erlotinib. Uh, those kinds of changes leading to um, uh, active uh, genes that are drug targets in gastric cancer are not as common. What is more common in these tumors are what we call amplifications or deletions, where basically you get changes in the amount of copy of a gene. You know, in usually every gene in your body, you have one copy you inherited from your mom, one copy you inherited from your dad. But what could happen in cancer is that you could have changes in this and you get many, many extra copies of a particular gene that can promote the cell to grow, or you could delete a gene that helps uh, slow a cancer down. And for example, the ERB2 gene is very frequently amplified in gastric esophageal and breast cancer. And the patients who have that event are the ones who are treated with a drug called trastuzumab or Herceptin. Um, there's also translocations that link together two different genes to make a, a fusion uh, that's not as relevant, especially for therapeutics and gastric cancer. Next slide. Um, if you just, perfect. Um, and so, you know, the reason that we are um, um, looking at the genes to think about the, both the biology of these cancers and therapy is that the idea is, is that the very uh, genes that get activated in the genome and are pushing the cancers to grow are things that the cancer continues to need. And Therefore, if you could find what's making the cancer grow, that becomes that very thing you'd want to take away from the tumor. And what we really are trying to do is try to find the drugs that could block the 
the, uh, the particular uh, growth promoting gene turned on in each tumor. And what makes this complicated is that not all cancers are the same. If every single stomach cancer had the exact same genes turned on um, and they were all exactly the same, you know, we wouldn't really need to do profiling in patients and study their genome because we would already know what's there. But the truth is, is that every patient's tumor's genome is different. Um, sorry, that was my phone. Um, every single um, uh, patient's genome is different and so are, therefore, even patients whose tumors may look identical under the microscope may optimally benefit from uh, different therapies, uh, you know, picking drugs that are more targeted to the particular gene alterations in each tumor. And so our hope is we could use gene profiling and cancer to find out what's driving different tumors and help us select, to select uh, optimal patients. Um, the next slide, please, is just a, a simple cartoon of this is that um, if you go to the next um, image, yeah, and keep going, yeah, is that, you know, basically, you know, we've had uh, in the past, the way we've developed uh, cancer therapies is by asking what's the best chemotherapy for breast cancer, the best chemotherapy for lung cancer, the best chemotherapy for uh, gastric cancer, you know, and part of that was the assumption that these patients were the same, but now by trying to use gene testing, we're going to try to uh, figure out that actually patients aren't all the same and you have to find uh, different therapies for <laughs> different people. And if you move to the um, next slide, um, and this is perfect, um, but it's, it's also, also the language here can get a little bit um, confusing because people say they're targeting genes, um, but that's not really true. Um, so what genes are, genes, again, are the recipe for making proteins. The genes are the cookbook for how the cell gets made. And so when a you know, cell has uh, there's a mutation in the KRAS gene, it means that the KRAS gene is different. And so the mutant genes make abnormal proteins. And it's almost invariably the case that the drugs that people take are trying to block the proteins not the actual genes themselves. Um, and uh, so and when we use targeted therapies, they're targeting proteins. So if you move advance one more. Yeah. So the idea is well, we, we study the genes because the mutant gene tells you which protein may be active. And so you could figure out um, which protein you want to target. You know, and there are many, many new inhibitors being developed to many different um, proteins in the cell. So next slide. Um, and, um, and so a lot of the work that's been happening, including some studies that, that we've led, has been trying to um, uh, understand the genetic diversity within stomach cancer. Um, and so, for example, this is a um, schematic picture from the conclusion of this big gastric cancer genome study that we uh, published a couple of years ago now where we uh, looked at the diversity of uh, gastric cancer and found that there were, we divide these into four molecular classes with different features. You know, I don't want to go too much into the details here, but there was one, the syn tumors that were very chromosomally, uh, or had chromosomal instability, which is where the word syn comes from, and those are the tumors that had RB2 amplification. There are some tumors that have um, a uh, infection with the Epstein-Barr virus, which is the virus that causes mononucleosis. Um, there's a group of tumors what's called MSI, or microsatellite instability, um, which are tumors that have uh, uh, essentially a proofreading error when they make copies of the genome getting lots of mutations. And there's a last group we call genome stable that uh, were ones that didn't have as many genomic aberrations and these were mostly the diffuse type uh, tumors. If you go into the next slide, we then um, expanded this in a newer um, analysis 
where we were looking, um, this was published last month, um, broadening to both esophageal and stomach cancer. And a, a, a conclusion from this paper was the very strong similarity of esophageal adenocarcinoma and stomach cancer, especially the, the SIN variant of stomach cancer. Um, and I think this is going to be pertinent because there's often um, arguments, especially when people have cancers at the GE junction, um, um, about whether they're esophageal or gastric, although increasingly I think it's sort of uh, more the, 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 the same than really two different cancers. Um, and let's just actually skip the next slide. Yeah, that's just so, and, and, and then here, this is from our paper a few years ago, where we sort of break down, you know, we had these different molecular subtypes, and we looked at some of the key genes in them, and, you know, again, so lots of data here, don't, um, don't get lost in the weeds here, but it's basically, this was just showing that different individual tumors, and in each sample here is a line up and down, is that just because a tumor is in the SIN group or the MSI group, the actual individual genes that are active can be quite different. So there's a lot of diversity here. Both there's different subtypes of gastric cancer, and even within the gastric cancers, um, different patients, even in the same group, and the two different patients with the SIN tumor might have two uh, quite different uh, cancer-promoting genes that are turned on driving their tumor. So um, next slide. Uh, please go through. So what does this uh, mean? So basically we have new, new ideas now about the particular genes that are altered or uh, turned on in many stomach cancers. And what this information is doing is giving us ideas about the kinds of candidate therapeutic targets um, that may be useful for certain patients. And in many cases, again, um, these are targets that may just work for certain patients patients because the genomes are different between people. Um, however, just because we find a gene change, it's in no way a guarantee that a um, particular drug against a target will work. Um, but we, we hope we'll, this will help us identify possible targets and try to think about clinical trials where we could use gene testing to bring uh, particular drugs to patients. Uh, so please uh, move to the next slide. Um, Yep, a few more. Um, um, actually, can you uh, slide through a, a yes, perfect. Okay, you know, <clears throat> you know, and when you look at what I've said so far, you would, um, it would give the impression that maybe this wouldn't be so hard because um, you could profile the genome and figure that three people had three different genes that were turned on, either gene X, gene Y, or gene Z, and then you would just pick you know, the inhibitor for each of those targets. You'd give anti-X, anti-Y, or anti-Z. Um, but next slide, please. Um, just, yeah. But there's a lot of reasons that actually this, and unfortunately, is, is, is more complicated. Um, you know, cancers, you know, are very um, resilient and adaptive. Um, and even when you find a good targeted therapy, like a tumor has activated ERB2 and you give an ERB2 inhibitor, you know, they don't always work. And when they do work, often the effects are temporary. And there's a big question about understanding what we call the resistance, um, where the drug or the, sorry, the cancer learns to work around uh, what the uh, inhibitor is. People often use the term resistance when they're talking about like bacteria, you know, if you've taken an antibiotic, you might develop resistant strains of the bacteria where the drug no longer works. You know, uh, cancers can do the same things. So in addition to understanding what the targets are, we also need to think about um, as we start going after these targets and bringing in drugs to hit these targets to learn how the tumors are going to become resistant so we can uh, be ready to uh, make our therapies even better and to block their ability to become resistant to the cancers. And often this involves work in the laboratory. And it's hard to do all this in, in uh, patients. Uh, but you know, in, in, in our lab, for example, this is 
uh, a very important area of where we're working now. Next slide. Yeah, this, you know, we're really trying to think about is not just you know where we are right now, but where we're going to be in the future. Because I think where we are right now has been studying the genome and finding the right targets and starting to bring the right targets into or right the, find bring the right drugs that hit these targets into patients. You know, in a rational way where we use genome testing to select patients uh, who might benefit by certain drugs. But we have to be, you know, thinking about the future, and the, the future is really understanding that just one drug for one patient is not going to be enough. But we have to figure out how to uh, combat resistance and develop good combination therapies. Um, so next next slide. And so basically, what we're thinking about is that this is becoming sort of a game of chess, where you, you know, have to think about a move you make against the cancer, but then think about how the cancer is going to respond to what you're doing. Uh, next slide, please. You know, and as we're trying to think about how to build new cancer therapies, um, there are also newer problems that we're dealing with now. Um, you know, I said we're studying the cancer genome. Uh, but the cancer genome isn't fixed. Uh, there's increasing um, um, evidence now, and more people really recognize that tumors are um, heterogeneous, uh, and tumors evolve. And by by that I mean is that you know different cancer cells, even in the same patient, actually can have different genomic differences, uh, meaning that the the mutations in you know, a cell in one place, such as, you know, a cell in the primary uh, tumor in the stomach may be different than a cell in the, um, um, you know, may be different than a cell in the, um, um, uh, that's in the liver, for example. And also these, uh, changes could happen over time, um, especially in response to um, therapy. So, um, um, you know, because if you put, like, if you give an uh, inhibitor to a certain gene, some, there might be some cells that, you know, don't have that uh, gene present, and those would, be, would, would have more advantage to um, grow over time. And there's also new ways we're trying to think about studying the genome in patients, even looking at how the genome changes over time by getting repeated biopsies. And now there's new approaches, such as using circulating DNA from the blood or blood biopsies to, um, to evaluate how, how the genome changes over time. And I think this is being used more and more. So next slide. So you know, this is a slide about uh, some of the research we're doing. That um, so key questions we have now are actually how to now that we have uh, good therapies to consider or sorry now that we have candid therapies that make sense uh, based on what we know about the genome how do we figure out what are the best therapies to bring into patients and now how do we figure out how to, to build to, the tumors are going to become resistant to therapies how do we build drug combinations. You know, it's just too many drugs and uh, too many possibilities to do this in clinical trials, and it's also, you know, not right to do that kind of uh, experimentation in, in people. So we have to really bring cancer into the laboratory, cancer cell into the laboratory to test uh, these different ideas. And so we're, we're building what we call models where we're, um, you know, studying cancer in the lab in different kinds of systems. In some cases, we're building mice that have cancer that looks like human cancer. In other can cases, we're actually studying human tumors by growing them in laboratory uh, models. And we need to have uh, many of these models to figure out the <laughs> diversity of real cancer and how they're going to um, respond. And next slide, please. Yeah, here's just you know an example of how well, we could get uh, fresh um, 
tumor biopsies from patients, um, either from the primary tumor or a metastasis, we can uh, grow them such as these ways where we uh, grow them in the flanks of special uh, mice and then can uh, you know, do clinical trials by, um, in these mice by sort of giving the same drugs we give to people, but then um, invest in trying to determine how the uh, tumors respond. And so that's just an example of the kind of work that goes on in the laboratory. And but next slide, please. Um, so what's very important for people to think about is what should they do. Um, next slide. Um, so a lot of people ask, like, well, should I get my tumor profiled? Well, it's definitely increasingly possible to get tumor um, profiled by various uh, genome assays. And actually now this is you know, happening not just from tumor tissue, but sometimes from the blood biopsies that I uh, mentioned. You know, the, I think um, the place now where people are increasingly doing this is uh, definitely in the uh, metastatic or uh, stage four setting. Um, but uh, so far, this kind of genetic testing is uh, not standard of care. Um, and I would say, you know, if we, if we knew what to do with all the data, you know, it would be standard of care. Um, you know, for example, by, I guess by contrast, it is standard of care to test for the ERB2 or HER2 gene in these tumors because if you find it being positive, getting the drug Herceptin is standard of care. So everyone with stage four cancer gets that test. But the, uh, you know, the genome testing is still, um, I don't know if you call it research or not, but still not standard. And however, it's, you know, definitely um, worth considering because these data may give you, you know, ideas about especially possible clinical trials. But again, I put a lot of caveats in there because, you know, it's not, for, there's no guarantee that you know, you'll find a possible therapy, you'll find a therapy, or it's definitely no guarantee that if you find something, it's necessarily going to, uh, to be effective. So next slide. Uh, so, you know, for people who are interested in getting their tumor profiled, there's uh, several different uh, options. You know, a number of different uh, big academic centers, such as ours uh, here in Boston, have their own um, homegrown um, um, uh, approaches for doing this. We have, you know, assays that we have developed here that we do on patients treated here. Um, you know, there beyond that, there's a lot of people in uh, in a lot of people in the private area uh, who are doing this. And um, there's you know this is um, you know better or worse big business. And there's a lot of people uh, moving into this area who are either doing genome testing on the tumor itself or from uh, DNA in the blood. You know, the insurance coverage for this is inconsistent and um, although I think it's probably increasingly becoming uh, accepted. And I think there's still not, still not the case that all of the companies and assays are created equal. And I think it's, it's still, um, there's still some variation that are there. And even still, I think some, sometimes the in interpretation of these data, uh, you know, can be a little bit challenging, although that is getting better over time. I think there's one more point here. Mary, okay, yeah, but again, these data can be um, uh, can be uh, useful to, to to think about uh, different options, including you know most particularly for clinical trials. Uh, so next slide here. So some summary of these points. So basically, what I was trying to talk about was that alterations in the genes are largely what uh, we believe is responsible for cancer, and increasingly we're hoping to use these data that the particular genes turned on in each cancer, you know, may be good targets to consider uh, thera therapeutically. And many people are now trying to bring genomic profiles into the clinic to use this data to select therapy. Um, and this is a very exciting area, uh, very promising, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done uh, to figure out how to not just pick one drug for one patient, but really to develop more effective strategies to make these uh, drugs work and to make them work more in a durable fashion and to avoid resistance. 
Um, and I just want to quickly, then next slide, I know a lot of people are excited about um, immunotherapy. We, you know, do a little bit of work in this area, but I'm not a um, immunology expert by far, but this is a very exciting area. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so when people are talking about um, um, immunotherapy, generally it's not by, you know, um, like, giving a, um, you know, providing something foreign to the uh, person. It's not like giving a drug that, you know, that puts in an active um, immune cell or, or something. But typically what immunotherapy means is trying to get the patient's own immune system to attack their cancer. And there are a few different ways to think about this. The one, the place that has been the most active now, and definitely in stomach cancer, has been more the non-specific immunotherapies, where you're um, essentially trying to take the brakes off the immune system or block what they call the checkpoints that reduce the um, immune system. And this is the, all the drugs in the PD-1 pathway, like a Keytruda or um, um, nivolumab, um, which are the ones most in gastric cancer are being used. The, the second class of immunotherapy, which is much more experimental, is in, or when you're actually trying to elicit a immune response by, for example, using a vaccine um, to try to, to, uh, to spark a new um, a, a immune response that does not exist. Um, uh, next slide, please. And um, the places that have been the most active in gastric cancer, again, are these uh, what we call checkpoints. Um, these targets like uh, PDL1 and CTLA4, where essentially the way to uh, think about this is that our um, immune cells have um, abilities to be turned on, but also have mechanisms in place to turn them off. And you know the reason we have diseases such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or what what have you, which are autoimmune diseases, is that sometimes our immune system becomes too active and those systems don't work. Um, but also, we learn now is that cancers find ways to co-opt those systems and try to turn off the um, immune system. So by uh, trying to turn off the off switch. Uh, we're trying to activate the immune system, and that's just what these drugs like PD-1 do. They try to block those um, approaches that the immune system is using to, uh, sorry, the cancer are using to turn off the immune system. And next slide, please. And this is an, an, an older slide, but, but now there has been uh, a number of studies showing definitely si signal where um, people are starting to see um, responses, uh, especially to um, the PD-1 or the PD-1 C2A4 combinations um, in uh, gastric cancer. Um, you know, the it's only a minority of patients who are benefiting now or re responding, and people are still trying to understand who might be the patients who respond. These drugs are not yet FDA approved in stomach cancer, but you know, definitely are being used more um, both in clinical trials and sometimes um, even out of clinical trials. So this is an area of clear promise, uh, but some of the, the rules and the best combinations and the patient selection are still um, emerging. Um, yeah, so as I, uh, please go to the next slide. Um, so as I said, we don't have FDA-approved immune therapies yet. There are a lot of new trials that have promising data, including the you know the PD-1 drugs from Merck and Bristol Myers Squibbs are the one that have been um, um, uh, most um, uh, have most heavily studied and have the most data. But there's a lot we still need to learn about who will respond. Uh, there are some data, including work that we've done, arguing that certain groups of patients, like those with EBV positive tumors or microsatellite instability may be more likely to respond, but we still don't know yet uh, who 
is what are the, the best markers to pick patients, uh, how these patients will become resistant, or how to combine these drugs with other therapies. So these are definitely um, emerging questions to, to be pursued in the lab and clinical trials. Um, so that's all that I have right here. I'm uh, happy to uh, take some questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Bass. Um, that was very informative. And I will go ahead and read some of the questions that we received during your presentation. Sure. Uh, the first question that comes in is, genomic sequencing or profiling of the original tumor helpful to come up with therapies for a recurrence when the original tumor has been surgically removed? In other words, would the genomic profile of a recurred tumor be expected to be substantially similar to the original tumor, or could it be completely different? That's a great question, and that's, that is a... Um, that's a place where we're starting to look at. I think the more we look, um, I think there's more and more data pointing to things being different, or that there are there is genomic evolution over time. Um, I, I think it it has been common in esophageal and gastric cancer uh, to um, go back to the sample before surgery to do the biomarker profile profile. Especially when patients um, um, have a re recurrence shortly after their surgery, um, you know, I'm, um, you know, this is partially my sort of bias here, and uh, but I'm, um, in, I'm, I'm becoming, I'm becoming personally more skeptical of that approach, um, and thinking it, it because of the potential for variation, you know, would, would I personally, and this is my opinion, um, I'm more um, enthusiastic now about getting repeat biopsies at that time for the testing. Um, you know, there, there, there is that, um, that balance, though, because, you know, at that point, it, whether it's a tumor in the liver or something like that, uh, getting a sample is obviously easier said than done, and those biopsies carry risk. And so I think that's part of the um, the balance there is that because there is you know risk risk of the um, from the procedure, but uh, and that is going to vary from patient to patient depending on um, you know different people might have different risk of a procedure based on their age and health and you know whether they have you know uh, bleeding or clotting problems, but from a, in terms of what would be the best genetic test to do, I think it probably would be better to, um, to, uh, to study the recurrence, but, um, you know, that's my, um, that's my um, uh, opinion now, and I think that, that may, you know, probably, uh, it's not necessarily what's more routine in practice these days. Thank you. The next question that comes in, in is in looking at somatic alterations. First question is, what causes somatic alterations? And then the second question to that is, does H. pylori cause an alteration in the genome profile? Oh, uh, very good questions. So, um, so some somatic alterations just, you know, happen um, um, basically over time. I mean, there's a certain you know, you know, if you um, if you have to copy three billion um, letters again and again and again, there's some rate of just making typographical errors, and you know that the background rate is usually in the like one every you know million letters you might make a typo. Um, now there there are other features that can increase that. There are, there are exposures that are mutagenic that cause mutation, you know, classic ones being that, you know, um, ultraviolet light can cause mutation, which increases risk of melanoma, <laughs> tobacco scope, smoke can cause mutations, you know, this leads to the associations with lung cancer. You know, I think in, um, 
I think uh, you know in esophageal, esophageal and gastric cancer, um, I think there are I think there is definitely uh, inflammation that occurs. You know, in some cases that's from the Helicobacter itself that causes inflammation, and that probably contributes to mutation. I think whether I think the Helicobacter bacteria itself doesn't directly damage DNA the way you'd see with like tobacco smoke but probably I think you know the, uh, probably uh, the inflammation that comes from either uh, helicobacter or comes from gastric reflux leading to barrett's esophagus I think those are probably some of the culprits that contribute to the mutation rates but to a certain extent this is uh, something that that that, that um, happens at a low level over time in all cells. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what are your thoughts on individual individualized TIL therapy? Are the risks associated with that greater than nonspecific immunotherapy? Um, def definitely not something I'm an expert on. I mean, there's a lot of people trying to develop those individual Either like individual vaccines, or actually try to get in this case trying to take out the uh, the the uh, T cells to, and to try to expand them and then reimplant them. Um, I think um, I don't know of these things being effective yet, um, uh, and I don't. I'm not definitely an expert on their on their safety, so it's probably not the best thing for me to to comment on um, in terms of how. Uh, because I, I don't know the clinical data and how they how the safety profiles vary from uh, uh, compared to some of the um, the current kinds of inhibitors. And I imagine there's probably very different protocols and approaches for doing these, which probably um, influence the actual risk of different <laughs> procedures. But all that is needless to say very uh, experimental now, and definitely nothing that's um, uh, you know clearly to my knowledge, demonstrated to work, you know, um, uh, you know, or maybe beyond sort of individual patients, but nothing that's sort of been, you know, you know, very reproducibly um, successful yet, to my knowledge. Thank you. Um, this next question is, again, another two-part question. How many alterations are known to cause stomach cancer, and is it possible to have multiple alterations? Um, let me answer the second part of that. So the second part is definitely yes. You know, these cancers very often have, um, they, you know, they have many, many um, mutations, and you have multiple events often in the same tumor. So, um, so that definitely can happen, and you can have more than one uh, growth-promoting uh, event in the same cancer. Um, so that that definitely is the case. Um, so it, it often takes more than one um, alteration to um, to cause cancer. Um, the first one is a much more complicated question because there are the genomes; these tumors are extremely uh, complex with many different alterations. You know, and because there's just the random mutations that happen over time, there's a lot of uh, genomic events or genomic mutations in a cancer cell that are just there but aren't really what's making the cancer cell uh, um, uh, cancer. So it's, you know, it, it's to prove which events are um, the ones that are clearly important functionally um, is definitely a matter of debate, but I'd say definitely there are, you know, at least several dozen clear genes that have some contribution uh, to stomach cancer when they're altered. Now, it doesn't mean that all patients have all of these dozen genes. A number of them are present in, you know, two or three percent of patients. But there are dozens of different genes, either that are ones that are turned on to promote growth or ones that are uh, turned off to sort of to slow the ability or turned off to serve cutting the cancer's breaks. Okay, 
Well, thank you so much. And that's all the time we have for questions today. So thank you, Dr. Bass, for your time and your presentation again. As you know, this webinar was brought to you by Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. Thank you to Dr. Bass and from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And thank you to our sponsors who helped make this webinar possible. Our title sponsor, Boston Biomedical, and our platinum sponsor, Lilly Oncology. As a reminder, please check our website and your calendars to join us for an event that's coming soon near you. Thank you to all of our listeners today. This concludes our first in a series of 12 webinars. Our next webinar will be on March 31st about targeted treatments and immunotherapy. To view recorded webinars, please visit our lecture library on our website. We would love to hear your feedback, questions, and thoughts before then. Please send your comments to patient.resource at debbiestream.org. Thank you again for everyone and have a great day.